We are a couple minutes past 7.30. We will get started just to be respectful of everyone's time. Before I hand it off to Dr. Caravella, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping rules before we get started. So at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should be able to see an option where there's a Q&A. If at any time you do have any questions throughout this presentation, please feel free to drop them in there. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we will be sure to pull all questions from there and ask them. And then if at any point you have any comments or anything you'd like to bring up, there is a chat feature as well we'll where you will be able to chat with our panelists. And with that, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Caravella. He is our Chief Quality Officer here at Allied Physicians and also a great pediatrician. Welcome, Dr. Caravella. Hi, good morning, good, good evening, and welcome to Allied Physicians Group Continuing Education Program for 2024. Tonight's lecture will pertain to neurological, uh, neurosurgical uh, conditions and in pediatric practice. I'd like to present Dr. Mark Sedane. Dr. Sedane is the Vice Chair of Neurological Surgery and the Director of Pediatric Neurological Sur Surgery at Weill Cornell uh, Medicine and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Hospital. Dr. Sedane is nationally recognized in pediatric neurosurgery with a strong focus in childhood brain tumors. He is regarded as a highly accomplished micro neurosurgeon and expert endoscopic surgeon and is a compassionate advocate for children. Dr. Sedane received his undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan before attending Wayne State University Medical School. His postgraduate residency included general surgery internship at the University of Michigan and neurosurgery resident at New York Hospital, at New York University Hospital. He completed his training as chief clinical fellow in, neuro, in pediatric neurosurgery at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Dr. Sedane oversees a traditional laboratory focusing on improving methods for treating children with incurable brain tumors. His work is nationally regarded for the development of drug delivery techniques for childhood brain tumors that are not amenable to surgical removal. Dr. Sedane is board certified by the American Board of Neurosurgical Surgery and the American Board of Pediatric Neurolog Neurological Surgery. He is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and the American Academy of Pediatrics. He holds joint appointments at Memorial Sloan Kettering and the Hospital for, and Hospital for Special Surgery. He serves on the editorial board for neurosurgery and the Journal of Neurosurgery, Pediatrics. He serves as chairman of the neurosurgery committee of the uh, Children's Oncological Group. Um, and in his spare time, he gets an opportunity to talk to us. So um, I'm glad he's not in his scrubs because he, he uh, came here from the operating room, I think. Uh, please welcome Dr. Mark Sudain to talk about lumps and bumps in children. Thank you, Dr. Caravella. Uh, just uh, give me a thumbs up if the audio is okay. Yes. Wonderful. Kind, kind introduction, I appreciate it. And you're right, I did just change out of my scrubs after a long day today. Um, so everything you mentioned in the introduction are passions of mine with regard to oncology, translational research, uh, the tumor, brain tumor front endoscopy, but that usually puts pediatricians to sleep. So, so I force myself to uh, talk a common language here and things that I think pediatricians are apt to see in their office. Uh, I usually call them the gatekeepers of everything that I see and in various uh, frequencies, they'll see some of these pathologies. Um, as you can see there in the bottom of the slide, I have one of the greatest pediatric neurosurgery jobs in the world because uh, I get to leverage and exercise really great talent at uh, a lot of different institutions that are different in, in a lot of different ways. But uh, you know, two premier Ivy League medical schools between Walt, Walt Cornell and Columbia, uh, New York Presby, which uh, has been an amazing place. I came here in 95 and I've been here ever since. And then... Uh, MSK, where my true passion in pediatric neuro-oncology lies, and a lot of the research that I do in the clinical front is centered out of that the institution. You mentioned HSS as well. Um, part of this introduction with the allied group came from uh, uh, last year when I was seeing patients out in uh, eastern Long Island in New Hyde Park. I had the opportunity to visit a couple of practices within the, the group. And uh, I must say that I found everybody extremely professional, very engaged, very accommodating, um, just a great interface. And I, and I look forward to any future 
interfaces I can have with anybody in the group or anybody on the uh, on the meeting uh, this evening, uh, and we'll get into some of the uh, contact information in a second. Now, if I can make that advance, there we go. Uh, I mentioned some of the greatest parts of my job, and the other is in the center of the picture here, based on the colleagues that I have. <clears throat> Um, Dr. Feldstein and myself, he's far right, myself, he got to Columbia about a year, two years before I landed at Cornell, and we've been great friends and now colleagues ever since. New York Presby has asked us to work together between our, our joint programs, and we've been doing that for about three years, and it's been extremely energizing. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Greenfield, next from right, and then Dr. Caitlin Hoffman, each with areas of expertise in different domains. Dr. Hoffman's our, our focus and our co-director of their pediatric craniofacial uh, program with craniosynostosis and syndromic and non-syndromic forms, Dr. Greenfield. Also uh, an intense investigator in the brain tumor realm, as well as an expert in Chiari and craniovertebral junction abnormalities, skull-based surgery. Uh, and I'm happy to say as of July, we'll have a fifth partner, uh, and that's uh, Dr. Tame O, who's gonna be joining us to round out our complex spine deformity uh, reduction, uh, vertebroplasty, fetal surgery program. So we're looking forward to and spasticity. So uh, a quite comprehensive group, and we've uh, grown since I got to Cornell by myself uh, 28 years ago. You see there on the far left, uh, some of the current sites that we see patients at. And these are all outpatient facilities. The surgery is continuously focused at uh, Cornell on the Upper East Side in Columbia up in Washington uh, Heights. Um, but we do see patients out in uh, Eastern Queens and Brooklyn, Scarsdale, Westchester, Terrytown, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, White Plains in the past. I mean, excuse me, a New Hyde Park in the past as well. So, so we we like to think that we can bring services to the communities that you all serve um, out of convenience. It's not always easy getting back and forth to Manhattan. Nevertheless, uh, as mentioned, the the surgery is always going to be a focus here for for good reason. Um, a QR code on the uh, lower right, if you scan that, will take you right to our website to give you more information about our wonderful group. And with that, I'll jump into the topic of tonight's uh, discussion. And I hope to finish this within a, about a half an hour, leave plenty of time for questions if they should occur. Um, you know, th this gets a little unwieldy, and I've abbreviated this intentionally. Uh, from the standpoint of uh, what one should be thinking of with regard to kids with, as we, as I titled the talk, lumps and bumps or scalp masses, skull skull masses, however one might paraphrase it. Um, but they're, they're distinctly different if you look at the continuum between something that's present in the newborn versus somebody who's in infancy or older childhood. And helps narrow down the, the differential quite a bit. And again, I've intentionally left out a number of pathologies, uh, rare malignancies, for instance, vascular disorders, the angiomata. Uh, I've left those out intentionally, just given the rarity and the fact that some of those are not um, neurosurgical issues. Happy to say that if you really whittle this down <clears throat> from the standpoint of what you would expect to see in your clinical practices, you know, th these brackets are going to probably accommodate 90 plus percent of what you might see in the office. It's rare you're going to see a child with an otherwise undiagnosed encephalocele. Um, this is a rare entity that I'll talk about, spontaneous subapneurotic fluid collection, sinus pericranii. Uh, and uh, I will see periodically from a primary care pediatrician on an annual basis. Excuse me, aplasia acutis congenita, I'll go over as well. That's usually detected immediately postpartum. Uh, uh, but cephalohematomas are probably the next to kappa. The largest uh, frequency of masses I'll see in the newborn as referred by primary care physicians. And then you see on the right, similarly, the overwhelming majority of diagnosis is going to be lumped into really dermoid cysts, uh, isolated calvarial LCH that I'll go into with these in a little more detail. And ridging, and I see this all the time from the standpoint of ridging of a suture. It doesn't always mean craniosynostosis, and I'll go over some of that differential in a moment. Um, and the rest of these, again, very rare uh, entities that uh, I will focus on to some degree. Um, 
So getting into what we see in the newborn, uh, you should and probably most are very familiar with CAPA, uh, Cessanadium, uh, and that's really just uh, edema or blood collection just underneath the subcutaneous tissue, as you see in this coronal cartoon, <clears throat> where the blood aggregates above the pericranial tissue. This would be a coronal section through the skull, the brain down here, calvarium here, pericranium delineated by uh, this kind of white line here, and then the, the, the periosteum there, as I mentioned, and the galea just above that. So blood clots can occur in any of these layers. <clears throat> We're not going to concern ourselves with those that are inside the calvarium, just because that's not what you're going to detect in the office, I hope. <clears throat> but most of these will be masses that are within the uh, scalp itself. So the most common, usually immediately postpartum, as mentioned here, you'll see those children. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have this kind of contour that respects these cranial sutures because it can migrate you know, in, in any direction. And it's not limited by the periosteal tissue, this gap being a cranial suture, sagittal, lambdoid, metopics. Um, and the other is it's very blottable. It, very, it feels very soft. It has no relationship with head position. If you sit the child up or lay them down, it's going to behave essentially the same way, but it's going to feel essentially like a water balloon underneath the scalp. Um, the cephalohematoma, however, the onset usually comes in several hours or more likely in several days postpartum. And parents, pediatricians will say, I can assure you this didn't exist at the time of birth. And now I can see it. Now I can feel it. Um, it goes through certain uh, evolutions that I've listed here on the right with regard to its clinical features. These always tend to respect, for good reason, the periosteal tissue. The periosteal tissue, as I mentioned, is limited by the calvarial sutures. And any blood component underneath the periosteum is going to stop at those junctures. So the common places, the coronals, lambdoids, squamosal. And I'll show you some examples of that. <laughs> And the other reason I see these kids is because, yes, we saw this at the time of delivery or shortly thereafter, and over time, it's gone from something that's very firm to more aqueous, and now we're worried about CSF. Um, typically, as they age in that one to two week time period, you, you'll see that they have this annular feeling to them. The, the, the lateral circumference of this is usually very fibrous, as you see depicted in this image off to the right. And the central part of that feels more liquid-like. So you can feel this what feels like a donut underneath the skin. Very, very predictable for subgaleal or subperiosteal hematomas, cephalohematomas. <clears throat> Fortunately for both of these, and it'll be a recurring theme in most of the talk today, that you know surgery is not typically needed uh, for either of these. They're, they're thought to, and they do, uh, pretty much resolve spontaneously in the case of the cat, but the cephalohematoma, somewhat more delayed in, in weeks, um, and then rarely you will see these calcify that we may get asked to contour from the standpoint of uh, calcification. These are the typical appearances of both of those. So on the left here, very blottable. You can see that finger pushing fluid beyond the coronal suture. So it goes well beyond the periosteal tissue. Um, very soft, immediately postpartum. Uh, leave well enough alone, it'll go away. Uh, this is fairly classic when you see somebody with bilateral cephalohematomas. And this is a great demonstration of a kid I saw many years ago <clears throat> with the coronal sutures and the periosteum that uh, limits the migration of those either across the midline or forward or backwards with the lambdoid suture, what I call this Mickey Mouse appearance. Surprisingly, as bad as that looks after a couple of weeks, the overwhelming majority of these will, will spontaneously involute. Um, this is my 28th year of practice. I think I've operated on two in my entire career, and they were probably premature in my career, and that if I left them alone, they probably would have remodeled. The rare exception to those, since they're underneath periosteum, and periosteum is very uh, osteogenic, is you'll rarely see this, and this is one of these children that I did offer surgery for. Um, so this very large respecting the lambdoid suture, this deformity in the parietal area, very common. Um, and you see this semi-aqueous nature outside the calvarium, but then this ossified rim. So 
So eventually left alone, that'll turn into a solid piece of bone. It will remodel to some degree. It's on a hair bearing part of the skull. So the need for intervention here is not one of clinical or neurologic issue. It's more of a cosmesis and deformity. Uh, but again, I think if I've learned anything in three decades, it's be more conservative than not. And they, they will uh, resolve over time. Um, and that's the, the very common caput and cephalohematoma, the mesosified version, cephalohematoma deformans. Um, so those are quite common. The, the other entity that you'll see in the subgaleal collection that feels just like a caput uh, is this rare entity referred to as either delayed or spontaneous subapneurotic fluid collection. It's not a real well-characterized abnormality, but nevertheless, a couple of take-home messages like caput, uh, very blottable, crosses suture lines, as you can see here, crossing the midline. Uh, but it, of note, it has this, this is an MRI scan that was done on a child that we cared for, it, exactly like CSF as far as signal intensity. It doesn't have blood products in it. It's thought to be composition-wise, based on those that have been tapped, more, most consistent with CSF. Probably has to do with some minor trauma at the time of uh, delivery, um, where there's a small tear somewhere in the dura that allows uh, the fluid to escape. I'm sure, and we see plenty of subdural hematomas that are undetected or subclinical. So it wouldn't be too surprising if CSF over time egresses into the subgavial compartment. Again, universally, these tend to involute on their own. Uh, we typically don't recommend aspiration, head wrapping, et cetera. Um, largest series that I, I think gives you a pretty good sense of the diagnostic and therapeutic approaches uh, from the Hospital for Sick Kids uh, several years ago. Not a very large series, I think maybe nine. So uh, the rarity of this, I think, uh, is highlighted by that in a very busy high throughput center. I've probably seen two or three in my clinical career, but you will see these weeks after somebody will swear and uh, give testimony that there wasn't a cap, but immediately after delivery, a couple of weeks later, they come in with this big bulging subcutaneous mass. Um, but again, no surgical interventions warranted. Those typically go away on their own. Um, we do tend to image them just because they're delayed onset. I've seen one child with a bleeding dyscrasia uh, who came to see us several months of life with a large subgaleal hemorrhage. Um, so we do tend to image them just to document that they have the same composition uh, on an elective basis. So that's the uh, spontaneous subapneurotic fluid collection. Again, I'd be pretty surprised if this ends up in your office. <laughs> these kids, these are all neonatal pictures. Um, obviously, the ICU here, uh, two kids that I've cared for in the years gone by. These come in all various sizes, shapes, position. These knees are frontal or sincipital, occipital, very common. Um, and they can be quite large, uh, smaller. You can see here, and I'll show you an example of something that even is less impressive. But anywhere along the midline is kind of the general rule of thumb, excuse me, from the frontonasal orbit or a junction down to the uh, torcular or the external occipital protuberance. Excuse me. And these are fair game anywhere in the midline. Unlike, uh, say, the caput, uh, these will change their turgor depending on head position. So every time I talk to my residents about a scalp mass, I always ask them whether or not with a recumbent position or an upright position, it tends to get more compressed or full, uh, respectively. So anything that behaves that way tends to give you a good sense that it communicates with the subarachnoid space and CSF. Uh, and that's fairly typical for something that does communicate with the intradural compartment. So uh, the exception to that is uh, are some venous anomalies that I'll go over. But most of these you can differentiate just based on that alone. Left alone, these tend to evolve over the first several months of life. Uh, I've seen kids in the unit with small encephalocele like this. You bring them back two or three months, they triple in size. Most of that is CSF and path of least resistance. You know, versus the calvarium, it'll distend and distort the scalp, which is very distensible. So they tend to grow over time. Uh, as mentioned, they have some turgor associated with intracranial pressure dynamics. Depending on how they do is really a, a result of, is it, is it the tip of the iceberg or not? 
So in a child like this, for instance, versus someone like this, those that are more posterior, higher into the hydrocephalus, dandy walker malformation. Um, sometimes if there's a fair amount of cerebral uh, dysgenesis involved in this, then it's labeled as an encephalocele rather than a meningocele. Uh, seizures, uh, not uncommon. Uh, corpus callosum, agenesis. So, so many of these are dependent on the constellation of intracranial pathology, migrational disorders, versus just the lesion or the size of the lesion. So we rely heavily on MRI scan for prognosticating. We also rely on MRI, MRA, and MRV for understanding the vascular anatomy of some of these along the midline. Um, these all require surgery. Uh, relatively straightforward in the majority of cases. The results can be fantastic. Uh, and usually in the first couple of months of life, just due to the social stigma of having something like this the child at home. So those are referred to collecti collectively as cephalocele's, uh, encephalocele's or meningocele's or combinations of both. Uh, this you may see in your office from time to time. There, there's sometimes a cult. Uh, and I've seen a couple of teenagers that have come to see me because of very localized pain with something on the head that looks like this. It has this spiral hypertrichosis, different pigment with this blanched out or almost looks like a cigarette burn. And the central part of this like, looks like a hurricane. So these can be relatively, excuse me, small, tangential to the scalp. And won't even be noticed sometimes for years. And what they are is an encephalocele that just hasn't really gotten to the point where there is a extracranial component. It's really just cutaneous. So, but it has the same constellation of CSF and maybe some gliotic tissue, uh, as you see depicted here. These are very typical of these things on the vertex. Uh, right where the lambda and the sagittal midline come together. Um, and uh, probably see one of these a year. Uh, and again, not always as a newborn, uh, but sometimes as an older child. Uh, it's a mixed bag as far as whether or not I recommend treatment. For something like this that is otherwise asymptomatic, I leave it alone. Um, you know, the, you do run the risk, the sagittal sinus is under here. But most of the times I've operated on these for adolescents or above is when they come to me with very localized pain and uh, uh, tenderness if, if it's palpated, very, very uh, easily alleviated with correction. Where you basically just do a small craniectomy, tangentially ligate that, and you're essentially releasing a form of uh, tension on the dura uh, by repairing these and hence the pain. It's called an atretic encephalocele, something that never really has become fulminant. Um, you may see cases of this periodically, but again, usually detected at the time of birth, sinus pericranii. This is an example that a kid that came to see me months later. Uh, these are congenital abnormalities. Uh, you may be familiar with these things called emissary veins, which are veins that go from the intracranial to the intracranial to the extracranial surface of the, of the skull. So usually they're communicating between scalp veins and extracranial branches of the dura. Rarely, like you see here in this coronal section, there'll be veins that communicate into the sinus and then into this extra calvarial venous bullus. Um, you can see these distended veins coming from a, a mass here in this child. Because the venous sinus is fairly high pressure relative to other scalp veins, and sometimes because of the large amount of volume, you'll see some engorgement of the scalp veins. Um, in isolation means nothing, but when you have a palpable scalp mass that's very blottable, again, will change from an upright to a, a recumbent position, not necessarily communicating with the subarachnoid space, but with the intracranial venous blood flow, which also changes with head position. This is an example of an angio in a sagittal plane. The nose would be over here, the back of the head over here. This is the sagittal midline. And this bulby string of beads is all in these scalp. These are scalp veins, as you see in depicted in that picture. And then there's this communication that goes basically underneath the scalp through the bone and now is communicating with the sagittal sinus, which is a very large dominant vein that drains the cortical surface deep to the bone. So this direct communication obviously is unnerving just given the large amount of flow and dependency on the brain. These are variable. If they're tiny, 
I tend to leave them alone and they'll involute through infancy or a little bit later. Uh, just because of the low pressure uh, of flow state, they're not high pressure, there's no arterialized system. Um, and because of that low flow state, they will tend to, as the bone grows, shut themselves off. Typically not painful. Uh, you can reduce by pushing on them. Then if you let go, you'll see it kind of slowly evolve again. Um, and as I mentioned before, because venous pressure is communicating with the sinus, it's very head dependent. Um, this idea of risk of hemorrhage, you know, knock on wood, I've never seen a child yet. There are fatalities that are mentioned in newborns when these are very large and they're associated with cutis aplasia. Um, but most of these are for cosmetic reasons. Scalp mass that's getting bigger, as you see depicted here. Um, but this idea that they're going to hemorrhage, if they're small, I think uh, usually I advise just to continue observation. Um, if they are fairly large, you know, the real risk is if they do, for whatever reason, get a laceration, that's in direct communication with the sinus and that could be catastrophic. So easy enough to fix if you pay attention to how its relationship with the sagittal sinus is defined, and I won't get into that technical jargon, um, but that's sinus pericranii. Rare, but you'll probably see a case or two. This is an example of a, an unusual case that I, this is just done in the last year or two, that I swore was not a sinus pericranii. Your neuroradiologist said it was. Uh, you can see the bone here, very attenuated, cortical, which means it's been there forever. Um, and this small little communication right down here into the venous system. You can't even see it on this parasagittal cut. A radiologist did see a small little communication. They, they called it to their credit. I thought this was gonna be a dermoid. And this is uh, what it looks like at the time of surgery. It's this large bulbous collection of venous blood. We go subperiosteal and you can see this small communication here that was going into the sinus, easily controlled with some uh, substrate that closes that. And then we recontour the bone with a synthetic uh, substrate for bone ingrowth, uh, very easy to treat, but it's pretty rare to see one that late. But again, the progressive nature of this is why this kid came to see us with this uh, enlarging bulbous mass. Um, aplasia cutis congenita, I don't know if anybody has seen um, any such, but uh, like the atretic encephalocele, a lot of these can just be these small little cutaneous markings. These were a little bit more severe, a little absence of scalp with intact pericranium over it, some absent calvarium. These are potentially catastrophic. Uh, these we let heal by secondary, secondary intention. If there's pericranium there, uh, chances are with local care, you'll get ingrowth and epithelialization of these. Um, if there's missing pericranium, and certainly if it goes down to dura, there's a very, very large risk of uh, catastrophic hemorrhage from violation of the sinuses. Um, these typically, in this particular kid, we care for with allograft, uh, certain skin substrates that at a later point in time can be treated with a rotational skin flap. Um, but again, quite common in my practice, against once or twice a year, we'll see kids come in or born with lesions like this. Uh, secondary intention, not really considered to be surgical lesions, except in very rare circumstances where we're worried about infection or exsanguation. Um, a, good re a good review here from the standpoint of if you want to get some more information uh, with regard to management schemes. Um, but again, uh, the goal here is just local uh, wound care, and most of that will epithelialize on its own. That's aplasia cutis congenita. Now, moving into the older age group beyond infancy, and certainly during infancy, this is by far the most common mass we'll see. 90% um, of skull masses, scalp masses that I see in my practice, uh, sent by pediatricians are in this category of inclusion cysts or dermoid cysts. And what that means, as the, the name implies, is that this is an inside out almond where the Epithelium, which is labeled here in this H and E, is on the internal side of that mass. This is the external side. These are all normal dermal elements. And you get subcutaneous tissue, you get a desquamized or a keratinized uh, epithelium here, uh, adnexa, sebaceous glands, hair follicles. If you cut these open, a lot of times you'll see hairs. You might imagine that you see some hair in there as well. Very, very common. 
extremely common, very innocuous, very benign. They do slowly grow over time, um, unlike lymphadenopathy, and that's the bigger, biggest differential because of where they're located predominantly. Uh, these are examples of what these typical dermoid cysts look like. Um, on the fontanelle, you know, to some degree, usually in the frenozygomatic region at the hairline or down at the brow, quite common. And then the uh, retromastoid region. So when you see this in the retromastoid region, the, the question always comes up is that lymphadenopathy, you know, like any good clinician, if they've got a URI, if they've had a scalp incision, if they've been ill with a febrile illness, you're going to bank on the fact that it's lymphadenopathy if you feel a chain of these or bilateral findings. Um, but if there's any concern, you give it what I call the test of time. If you give it four to six weeks, no harm done by leaving a dermoid cyst for months. Um, but if there's any question, you just give it some time, month, month and a half, two months. If it doesn't regress, and certainly if it tends to grow, you have your diagnosis. These are very firm. Uh, many of them are quite mobile. Uh, they're not tender and normal hair bearing when it does involve the scalp. Uh, and that's the typical presentation of these, but usually detected shortly after birth, slowly growing, very, very focal nodule. Um, these have a predilection for forming at the site of cranial sutures, as you see here in these estimated uh, frequencies. Um, so most of these, as I mentioned, lateral orbital region, uh, a lot in the what's called the teria, I mean the uh, asterion or the mastoid process uh, right behind the ear, the retroauricular. These are the ones that confuse or are confused with lymphadenopathy, anterior fontanelle, and those frontonasal ones. Uh, so usually at these suture sites. It can occur in other places, the squamosal suture, but most of those, if you see this in the lateral orbital rim, the retromastoid region that has those features, you know the diagnosis. I personally image very, very, very few of these. I don't bother with CT or MRI scans. This idea that they communicate with the intracranial compartment is exceedingly rare. And the truth of the matter is, if I find that at the time of surgery, I'll deal with it the way it should be dealt with, but with rare exceptions, squamosal, and those back here where the junction of the sagittal suture comes with the lambdoids, rarely you will ever see any intracranial communication. One tip off is if you see a dermal sinus tract, a pit here at the nose or in the back of the head, and it usually gives you a good indication there's a dermal sinus tract that goes intracranial. But these, almost never, this I've seen once in 30 years on the square muscle. So I typically don't image I don't bother with the sedation or the ionized radiation exposure. A lot of kids will come with ultrasounds, which is perfectly fine. It shows you these relatively cystic masses, echolucent relative to subcutaneous tissue. If anybody is so moved to get plain imaging studies, you'll see this, this hyperosseous or dense bone forming around it. All that tells you there's this lytic lesion, but it's been there for a long time. And hence you get cortical or corticated margins around these things. That's diagnostic. There's a very typical MR in the frenozygomatic region, a very large one in the occipital region. Again, in the occipital region, frenonasal area, I'll image them with MR looking for intracranial extension, but otherwise I don't pay much attention to doing anything in the way of diagnostic imaging. Very innocuous. 28 years of doing this, I've never had one recur after surgical excision. Uh, a lot of pediatricians ask, should I send them to plastic surgeons, general surgeons, neurosurgeons, whatever moves you. I can tell you in most of the groups I work with, they get a bit anxious just given the bone erosion and if it does go down to dura. So anything above the neck, uh, happy to see and send our way, we'll take care of. Typically, this is the same day procedure. Kid comes in the morning, takes about a half an hour. They sit in a recovery for an hour and then essentially go home. And again, knock on wood, I've never seen a recurrence yet. An example, intraoperatively, these very, very well delineated, demarcated lesions. This is one on the anterior fontanelle. Um, a lot of parents ask, what if I leave it alone? It'll slowly grow over time. Sometimes they can rupture and they look like they've gone away, but ultimately they will come back. Um, so I, I, I promised I would balance this talk with some innovation and effort we put into improving kids with uh, certain scalp masses. Um, it's an example of something we started doing many years ago, now over 20 years ago. So a lot of these frenozygomatic dermoids here, I have the permission of the family to use this, by the way. 
uh, we would make in plastic surgeons will commonly make incisions in the brow, very well tolerated. And as kids grow, and very inconspicuous, but you, you can't see it. And the, the hair doesn't necessarily grow right in the incision line. So we've started doing these. I started doing this a long time ago, making incisions at the hairline, uh, going in the subcutaneous tissue. As you see depicted here in this cartoon, this is the skin being lifted up. Um, short segment video here. So the child's face is this direction. Um, and we're just very easily going in the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, this is under general anesthesia. Our anesthesiologist, whether we do this open or endoscopically, always wants to put these kids to sleep for better control of the airway. See, once we get into this cyst, it, it separates itself very easily from the subcutaneous tissue. This is probably four or five centimeters away from the incision at the hairline. Um, and I'll speed this along. You'll see very good demarcation of the uh, lesion here, right there. This is the periosteum. The eye would be down here. So we got a great view and you know, some small blood vessels either to take care of. We cauterize around the perimeter of it. And these things then are elevated from the uh, bone. Sometimes they'll go through and through the bone and attach to the dura. So we can do these endoscopically. We have to drill um, quite readily removed. And we just kind of char the area with unipolar cautery to make sure no remnants will grow back. It takes about 20 minutes to a half an hour. And these have been great results. And now we've got two decades worth of experience and still no recurrences. So it might take 10 minutes longer, but in my hands, uh, we like the idea that the incision's more hidden. Um, this is the child, uh, you can see the small incision there, hair's growing back in, uh, very undetected. Um, older kids, especially pre-adolescent or adolescent, you may have heard of this. Sometimes it's called uh, eosinophilic granuloma or Langerhans cell histiocytosis is the uh, correct terminology, or LCH. Uh, these usually come to us with a couple weeks, uh, several weeks of progressive painful swelling somewhere in the skull. Um, and it, so relative to dermoid cysts, uh, encephalocele's, or other congenital issues, it'll be measured in several weeks. As you can see, they're usually pre-adolescent. Um, on plane imaging, you won't see that sclerotic rim. You see this lytic lesion. This is an anterior, posterior uh, uh, x-ray. So the orbit's here, the nose is here. You see this lytic lesion, but there is no, none of that sclerosis that I showed you with the dermoid, which all it does is tells you it's been there for a short period of time. So the bone hasn't had time to generate this osteoclastic or um, uh, ossified cortical rim to it. I always image these with MR, and that serves a couple of purposes. One is a diagnostic purpose to make sure it's truly a LCH. These typically go through and through bone. You can see there's this, this is the mass here, this is the nose, this is the mid-sagittal post-gadolinium MRI scan. And you can see the contrast enhancement as this flared out region, it thickens the dura. These are very inflammatory. They're not neoplastic, so they're not cancer. I depend on who you ask, and I'll stress that in a moment. Um, but quite focal, painful. The other reason for imaging is rarely you'll see some involvement of the CNS. So it's not a solitary lesion, but affects the CNS more systemically. They also require uh, long bone studies to make sure it's not hyper, I mean, a multi, uh, uh, multi osthotic, polyostotic forms of LCH. Um, and you can see this in, in this particular individual with the skull mass who has contrast enhancement in the hypothalamus. So rare, rare, rare uh, involvement with the intracranial compartment, which has a worse prognosis and a different treatment regimen. But this is the bone. This is the workup that these usually require because of the potential for systemic involvement. Um, the typical approach has been either localized curatage under general anesthesia or total excision. This is the inside uh, aspect of the calvarium after a dollar or the silver dollar size craniotomy is turned. We then cover that with synthetic or autologous bone. Excellent results, curative, usually same day procedure. Sometimes you can just curatage the lesion out. Um, it's fairly debatable as to what to do with these with regard to subtotal excision. Um, and I still have some of our oncologists who like the idea of using adjuvant chemotherapy post uh, resection. Um, many years ago, I got involved in a, so again, balancing this with some of the contemporary thought processes, 
in a multi-center study uh, center, uh, centralized out of Vancouver by Dr. Steinbach, who basically banked on the uh, the parallel approach in long bones with solitary LCH in the orthopedic literature said these heal if you leave them alone. Um, long bones probably more of a concern given long bone fractures, but but he was right. And many, many years ago, we started this observational multi-center study that was since published in the New England Journal. Uh, you can see the numbers here with regard to the ultimate outcome and how big these were. Uh, but look at the uh, time lag here. So, you know, just coming up to a five to 10 years of a lag, <coughs> excuse me, with none of these lesions ever progressing uh, and no missed malignancy. That's one of the big concerns that I get pushed back from my colleagues on. Um, so now when I see these and the radiograph fits the picture, I give them a six week interval to test as to whether or not uh, spontaneous involution is like, uh, likely. Um, and it's my preferred approach now. I don't operate on these kids anymore if I'm confident about the LCH, providing it doesn't have multi-system or CNS involvement. This is a very good example there of this. I remember this is just around the pandemic. This kid was scheduled for surgery at another center, came to see me. The imaging, very, very classic. There's a dural enhancement pattern going through and through the bone, very homogeneous. Uh, fortunately, the, the parents agreed with an observational approach. I think they were put on that study that was published. And this is the scan about a year and a half, two years later, where there's full ossification. The kid fell back and played sports. Uh, really not a worry in the world and never laid eyes or a scalpel on this thing. So, so it's a pretty impressive evolution of the management of what, when I was trained at NYU, it was always gross total excision and sometimes radiation therapy. So, you know, a great adjunct. One has to be confident about the diagnosis under the watchful eye of a uh, neurosurgeon or other specialist, but uh, can have a great outcome without involvement uh, of surgery. Um, you know, I, I commonly get a lot of kids sent my way for microcephaly, for macrocephaly. I'm not going into those entities, but the other is concerns by the pediatrician of the suture. The suture doesn't quite feel right. And usually when it doesn't feel right, they're talking about ridging of the, uh, of the cranial suture. Um, commonly at the lambdoid, most commonly at the sagittal and very common at the uh, coronal. And you can see here, beautiful young kid without much cranial deformity, but ridging of the metopic suture. I pulled this off the net somewhere. So I don't know the name of the dog, but a <laughs> cute dog. A cuter kid, but ridging of the metopic is quite common. It's not a surgical issue, you know, and if the child does not have any evidence of trigonocephaly or, <clears throat> excuse me, hypotelorism, uh, that will continue to remodel and uh, not need surgery. You can see it what looks like maybe the anterior fontanelle, but, you know, questions of ridging of the, I can move that, ridging of the uh, suture, you know, here just lateral of the fontanelle. But we get asked a lot to assess kids with ridging. Um, and again, it's up to us from the standpoint of trained specialists to know whether or not it's consistent with craniosynostosis. In isolation, with no cranial deformity, the likelihood that it represents craniosynostosis is extremely, extremely low. Um, so taken together, then it's a very good indicator. This is a child we operated on actually this morning, one of two strip craniectomies we did endoscopically. This is the back of the head. This is the front of the head over here in this very, very obvious ridge along the sagittal suture, uh, but you can't see the shape of this kid, but typically, you know, you'll know just based on deformity and dysmorphology alone. Uh, an example of sagittal synastosis where the sagittal suture is fused and hazed out here, you get this very large frontal or forehead compensation, restriction of the bitemporal or biparietal region, very, very obvious, this dolichocephalic or staphylocephalic hit. I said some words about trigonocephaly, fusion of the metopic suture. You get basically restriction of the bifrontal region, trigonal or triangular looking anterior calvarium. And then a unilateral coronal, which is the third most common, where one of the coronal sutures fused, it stops anterior progression of the anterior cranial vault. So you get this pulled back appearance. You'll see this in deformational plagiocephaly a lot, uh, but typically, when you see what looks like the forehead pulled back, you usually see flattening of the contralateral occiput. There's this tendency to morph the head just by squeezing it. 
This is associated with facial scoliosis, uh, 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 asymmetry of the orbital fossa, so one's pulled up relative to the other. Very obvious when you see it. So cranial ridging, sutural ridging, we will see them in 90% of the time not need imaging uh, for diagnosis, just based on dysmorphology. And this is the simple suture non-syndromic variant. We have a very, very busy service here. Uh, as an example, uh, with regard to uh, uh, the way we treat this today, uh, single suture non-syndromic, um, you know, the technological advancement of what we do has just been profound from the standpoint of the safety of the kids. I was asking our craniofacial coordinator today what our transfusion rate is for single suture synastosis metopic unilateral coronal or sagittal. And it's just shy of 4%. It's hovered somewhere between 3 and 4%, which is dramatic given where it was when I was in training. Uh, like I showed you with the dermoid, this is very typical from the standpoint of the approach. These are very easy to do. This is a metopic. So very simply, you see this trigonocephaly, kids under general anesthesia. And of course, you had frame hairlines here. So we make a small little <coughs> inverted smiling face. Oops, sorry. Inverted smiley face. And then basically place a device underneath the scalp, uh, which uh, affords us a great view. This is the leading edge of the bone that we've already started with a drill. So the nose would be over here. The dura is just below this uh, pledget here, and we're dissecting the superior sagittal sinus off the internal table of bone. You can see the ridging there. See that? I don't know if you got a glimpse of that. It's the periosteum that we spoke about before. That gets cut. It devascularizes, makes the resection a bit easier. All done, as you can see here in this inset, through a you know, one and a half, two, two and a half centimeter incision, basically under endoscopic guidance. Um, very straightforward. The earlier we get them, the easier this is as the bone thickens. Somewhere around five months, uh, we don't consider them to be great candidates um, just because the bone starts to get a little too thick. Uh, this is, again, a, a cautery that's used on the naked bone edge that we cut. Great for hemostasis. I mentioned transfusion is extremely rare. Takes, takes learning from the standpoint of the individuals working this. That's that sonopet that I was discussing before. So it doesn't have this spinning uh, saw that we use and historically have used, which is somewhat more traumatic. And this does nicely from the standpoint of hemostasis. Um, so again, trained hands, two people working, four hands, people are very familiar with this. It takes us about 45 minutes to an hour to do this, relatively straightforward. Again, very, very uh, busy group here. And again, uh, between Dr. Imani Rubo of Plastics and Dr. Hoffman, who are both on this paper, I believe, um, you know, our, our volume has grown tremendously. When I handed off the service to Dr. Hoffman and colleagues around here, you can see that we've increased tenfold with regard to endoscopic suturectomy, this dark green line, but a very busy service, very comprehensive, multidimensional. Uh, anytime you have questions, please send it. They're an extremely, extremely vibrant uh, and uh, easy to reach group. I did, meet, uh, did mention dermal sinus tract. Uh, if you ever see this repeated occult gram-positive meningitides, think of a dermal sinus tract, either here or back in the occiput, which is harder to diagnose because it's hair covered. But every time you see a, a hair follicle coming out of a small little pit, anywhere from the nasofrontal region to the back of the head, think of a dermal sinus tract. This is a relatively urgent need because bacteria can usually uh, transgress this, and usually there's a communication beyond the dura. So unlike dermoid cysts, so when you see these or hear of gram-negative or gram-positive meningitides, um, always inspect uh, in the mid-sagittal plane under light illumination whether or not they, they have a dermal sinus tract. A um, couple more entities, leptomeningeal cysts, you may have heard about growing skull fracture. I, I put this up here because I don't typically see kids coming back to the office. I don't recommend they come back when we see a myriad just a sampling, one or two a week, linear skull fractures, infants or otherwise. See a depiction of that here. Um, ping pong fracture here is what it's referred to. But linear non-displaced skull fractures, sometimes they'll lacerate the dura, you know, if they go down deep enough. And if that happens, then you have the capacity for arachnoid and CSF to herniate out of that fracture line and then start to accumulate in the subgaleal compartment. So I usually ask the patient and their family, depending on the age, 
who their pedi pediatric group is. We know them. We make a courtesy call. Someone's going to have a linear skull fracture. Could you please see them in two weeks? And if there's any obvious swelling or by the parent's testimony expansion, then we're going to see them in the office. Uh, these are rare. So it's a very rare sequelae. As I mentioned, one or two linear skull fractures we see a week. Maybe every three to five years, we'll see a, a growing skull fracture where that CSF is all contained underneath the scalp, but it just herniates out of that rare fracture, uh, rare fracture line. And if you do imaging studies, uh, you'll see that this is the time of diagnosis. I don't know the interval here, it looks like about five months. So, you know, not a lot of displacement. Um, then the kid comes back X number of months later with this mushroom corticated bone. It's slowly eroding uh, leptomeningeal because the dura and the arachnoid, and the arachnoid and the pia, excuse me, are herniating out through the defect and they'll in, because of pulsatile pressure, increase the dimension of that. So we do MRI scans when we're concerned or the kid is young. Then calvarium, there's cortical contusion, subarachnoid blood. If we see that on MR, I go after those early to avoid this. It's just a larger craniotomy, brain herniation, seizures, et cetera. So we will repair those if we see that concomitant injury very early. And again, I think it's a contribution we've made to the care of these kids to prophylax against it. I think this might be my last slide. Um, and that is uh, rarely, again, these excrescencies of bone. Um, any good radiologist, uh, I don't know if I did this CT, but any good radiologist will be able to read this as such. Now, the confusing part about this, this would feel for all intents and purposes, just like a dermoid cyst, retro, uh, retromandibular, a retromastoid, uh, very firm excrescence of bone, uh, probably because the, uh, the, the, the pain issue associated with this, unlike dermoid cysts, and, you know, classically, Osteomas have this nocturnal pain that responds very well to non-steroidals, um, very predictable of a mass like that. Um, and again, the pain is very, very easily treated with surgical excision where this is a quite a simplistic endeavor. See these rarely. The difference between that and osteoblastomas is overall size, I think greater than two centimeters in diameter, they're referred to differently, but they're not frankly malignant. So I'll finish there by saying that uh, I never won mentioned or showed you an example of malignancies. They are highly, highly, highly unusual. So when you see these individuals, the first thing I tell parents is, let's not worry about cancer. Uh, you know, this you can take off the table with rare, rare exception. So any of these that I mentioned, extremely good outcome, a lot don't need surgery, and I rarely do any imaging. So I'd say rather than when you see these kids run to do MR or CT, certainly not ionizing radiation, send them for an evaluation and we'll make the determination as to whether or not they need imaging. Ultrasound's not gonna hurt anybody with a small little retro mastoid or anterior fontanelle lesion, no downside to doing that. But refrain from pulling the trigger to do CT scans and MRI scans and let us make that determination just uh, out of sync for the, the kid, the anesthesia, ionizing radiation. This QR code, if you scan it, you should get my personal information, including my mobile number, call anytime. If I don't recognize it, I'm not answer. I apologize, but send me a text. Let me know, uh, know why you're trying to get a hold of me. Um, for inpatients, we have a very, very responsive transfer center. Uh, anytime, day or night, uh, from an ICU or otherwise, they, they work with the families to make sure financially they're cleared. Uh, this is my mobile number again, uh, for those that are interested. Um, then the other thing that I find very useful, and I think a, a lot of pediatricians, you know, some of the groups I've worked with for decades use this, parents love it, but if there's a question about something on imaging, kid in the ED, parents use this all the time. I'll send them this link, just let us, let, let me be aware, if you have a CD in a digitized version uh, out of PACS, it's easily uploaded into this, that goes directly to me where I get a notice, uh, and we'll try and expedite uh, your needs. I'll tell my staff as director of our program um, that I don't want parents waiting three months, two months, one month. If it seems to be a surgical issue, hydrocephalus, Chiari, any of these masses, craniosynostosis, we want to bring them in early. I mentioned endoscopic suturectomy. As I mentioned, if we see those kids beyond five months, we're not going to be able to offer them what is really state of the art. So don't be bashful. If you're not getting the response for your patients, their families that I'm telling you will provide, 
call me directly. We'll, we'll get them in and see them in a hurry. So uh, Sal, again, I want to thank you and thanks for the group. I'm impressed that there's 30 plus individuals this time of the evening. So I, I appreciate the attention. And if there's any questions, if anybody put anything in the chat, I'm happy to try and answer it. Thank you. Thank you again, Mark. This was great. Um, just a couple of things. So let me just get the timing right. So ridges, you know, suture considered issues. I mean, a lot of times it's just not that obvious to be able to get them in, but it's kind of becoming more and more prominent um, as they get older. So, you know, it might be very difficult to get them in before five months. So again, call me, it should never be difficult to get them in before five months. So a couple of things to say, just, to, you know, so we don't get inundated with kids with normal skulls. Um, the newborn, there's a lot of overriding of sutures, as you know, with molding, you know, during the birth process. It takes a little bit of a trained eye, but if there's a question, like I said, we want to see them early. Um, and I will say that in my entire practice, I've gone from a very casual, slow response to a kid with possible single suture synostosis to really get them in early. And rarely I'll use imaging study because I want to know. I want to offer that parent a minimally invasive endoscopic suturectomy. I want to know that at several weeks of life, you know, two months, three months at most. So there should not be a lag. And I didn't put in here, but if you go to our, our, our website, we have our craniofacial coordinator, Michelle Buon Tempo, who is a uh, excellent, very, very knowledgeable uh, person who will get those kids within a week. I, I assure you, it's not going to be a delayed aspect. And again, use my use my mobile number if you think you're getting pushed back. Okay. I, so I have a couple for you. Um, and I, I think Margaret will have a couple more, but um, occasionally we'll have the, the newborn come in. They've had, um, you know, some imagery done, uh, ultrasound, maybe it was a preemie, et cetera, et cetera. And they find choroid plexus cyst. Yeah. What do we do? Do we do anything? When do we follow it up? I was recently, I just read uh, an article of, you know, adults with issues related to choroid plexus cysts. So I figured, let me throw it out to you and find out because most times we were, you know, it's just there. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. So let, let me turn the question back to you. So I know your practice before you read that paper. So ultrasound that shows a choroid plexus cyst in a, in a newborn or a one month old. What have you right. usually advised them? Nothing. Yeah, we that's just exactly yeah, right. just observe. We don't do anything. Yeah, and that and that's exact. And that that should be the that should be the consensus. So listen, the rare, article threw me. The article threw me. So, so again, but think think in the context of the frequency of these, right? So the rare adult maybe that has a cyst coming somewhere off either the choroid plexus or the ependymol or neuroglial tissue. We'll see these interventricular cysts, but boy oh boy. I do a lot of endoscopy, intraventricular endoscopy. I can tell you the frequency by which I see non-MR detected cord plexus cysts just based on direct observation through the endoscope is huge. Um, the number of cysts I have treated, and I treat a lot of intraventricular cysts with endoscopic technique, um, symptomatic cord plexus cysts, boy, oh boy, I'm not sure I can think of one. Neuroglial cysts, other rare cysts in the third ventricle, Extremely, extremely rare. So your intuition is exactly right. You can see an <laughs> MR or an ultrasound report that says a choroid plexus cyst, no reason to move forward in any way, shape, or form. The problem that you'll have is the radiologist is going to say choroid plexus cyst could also be A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and then you're kind of stuck. But, right. but if they come right out and say it's most consistent with choroid plexus cyst, leave it alone. Okay. Um, Margaret, you have anything in the Q&A? Yep. So there's a couple of direct questions here. So the next one we had was, uh, let's see, occasion occasionally during imagery for headache, we find a Chiari malformation. Would you discuss Chiari malformation? And how are these managed, please? Do we have three more hours? <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. A uh, big topic. And if the group is interested, we can certainly provide you with a hour long symposium on the management, the workup, the diagnostic aspects of Chiari, because it is a big, big, big area. I'm going to give you a couple of snapshots. Um, I have a little bit of a character of being very uh, 
conservative about the management of Chiari malformations. Most should and do put a lot of weight on this type of symptomatology a child has. There's no other diagnosis more frequent, maybe pineal cyst, that I see that I send out of the office without surgical recommendations than Chiari. These are so ubiquitous. Um, what we really try to do is pinpoint whether or not the symptoms are in context with the Chiari. It's not always easy, I'll admit, but the kid who comes in with very typical exertional headaches, and we're talking about kids that are pre-adolescent or adolescent. So when they strain, stress, exercise, laugh, sneeze, they get acute stinging like pain in the back of their head that radiates up into the occiput, radiates along the shoulder girdle, um, associated with bilateral upper extremity paresthesias. It's a slam dunk. It's associated. You know that. Um, but then you've got myriad of headaches that have nothing to do with Chiari that one needs to be extremely, extremely cautious about. I always say I could live in a much nicer house and have a faster car if I operate on every kid who came to see me with the Chiari, but <laughs> it's the minority. And I'm going to say one out of 10 that reaches me through really good child neurologists or pediatricians that see a lot. Chiari, as defined by the radiologist, is so, so common. Um, Send them to us if you have any concern. Uh, we'll sort through the, the difficult nature of trying to associate or disassociate the headaches. Big topic. All right, thank you. Next thank up you. we have is, and sorry if I butchered these names, but is the alplasia cutis congenitia associated with any syndromes? Yeah, um, so I'm gonna exercise a little bit of ignorance. The short answer is no. So when we see these children with aplasia cutis congenita, and thank you for the pronunciation, you're right. Um, I don't think historically I've been sending those kids to a medical geneticist or even imaging the majority because of the rarity of intracranial uh, and lack of association with intracranial anomalies. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not as I'm not familiar with any known syndrome in the majority of these. I showed you that picture of maybe half a dozen lesions. The only child that I knew that we kind of pulled the trigger and did a more extensive workup was with that child with the very large eschar. Uh, that was a neonate. Um, and that child also had cortical uh, ischemic uh, issues as well. There's strokes in the brain. I think there is a genesis of the corpus callosum. So extremely rare from, from any association that I'm familiar with but I, I will plead a little bit of ignorance. <laughs> okay, uh, next up we have, what kind of skin lesions on the back or spine require imaging? Ah, <laughs> you know, I took it out of my talk out of courtesy for everybody. I didn't want to spend a lot of time. And again, happy to give another talk on spina bifida occulta or spina bifida in general. Um, I have a host of images, but uh, so I'll, I'll just go through them in brief. Um, from kind of the most obvious to the least obvious, uh, skin appendages, accessory limbs, you know, in the, in the spinal axis, we're talking about on the dorsal surface of the back, uh, from the gluteal cleft up to the cervical spine, any of those are going to warrant uh, imaging, there's no question about it. Uh, hypertrichosis, or what's called a fawn's tail, where there's real hyperpigmented hair, a very focal area that's coming out of the spinal axis. Those are going to show you some form of spina bifida occulta. Um, as you get down where the majority of things that cause angst in the neonatal unit and after and in your office, the biggie is at the dimple, right? So you get an invagination of cutaneous tissue. Um, depending on where it is in a rostral caudal plane and how big it is will dictate the level of concern that a specialist might have. My general rule of thumb is anything that's very apparent above the gluteal crease. So if you have to separate the gluteal to see it, you can almost rest assured it's going to be a sacrococcygeal dimple, which has no communication with the intraspinal pathology that we're focusing on, namely um, tethered spinal cord. So again, above that horizontal, the gluteal crease, there should be enough concern to, to send them in for evaluation. The, the other big category, the uh, angiomata. So red spots. We're not talking about the stork marks, you know, at the base of the skull, and sometimes these macular uh, hyper uh, hyperpigmented areas. But real angiomata anywhere up and down the spinal axis uh, requires imaging. 
another big topic of discussion is really what form of imaging and when. So spina bifida occulta or closed neural tube defect, these kids are not at risk for meningitis if there's not a dermal sinus tract, okay? So there's absolutely no urgency from the standpoint of making the diagnosis. Most of the urgency I will tell you comes from the parents or the pediatricians. I get very relaxed if there are typical cutaneous findings of spina bifida occulta because I don't repair them until four or six months anyway. But if there is a concern of a lesion that might represent spina bifida occulta as a neonate, you've got six to eight, 10 weeks to do an ultrasound, okay? That will, with very good definition, tell you whether or not the conus, <laughs> a whole nother debate, uh, whether or not the conus is low, all right? And sometimes we'll use that as a threshold to push forward with MRI scan or not, or better defined. Sometimes it's definitive, sometimes it's equivocal. But ultrasound for the first two months, pretty darn good for looking at conus position. Uh, beyond that, we're gonna use an MR. Um, and I really push parents hard if there's a question based on a sono or a cutaneous finding. A lot of these kids, we can do a feed and swaddle, we can give mild sedation for, but the quality of an MRI scan at 12 weeks is so much better and trying to get a writhing kid at two days with a small receiving coil, an adequate MR. So uh, there's a lot of debate built into this. Uh, again, so no, if there's a cutaneous lesion with a high index of suspicion, go ahead and do it. And if it's still a high index of suspicion, then I wait two to three months and do a formal MRI scan then. I don't know if that answers the question. It's a loaded question from the standpoint of the detail that's built into that a whole nother topic that we can focus on in a future CME if you're interested. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, next yeah. we have, um, this is actually a little bit of a case question. So just had a 15 year old hit on the head with a tennis ball, obvious concussion. Overnight, she felt like her nose kept bleeding, but no actual blood, similar sensation following in the morning. I saw her in the afternoon, no longer had the sensation, but I was very concerned about a CSF leak sent her to CCMCER. They did no imaging and just sent her home. No concern, question mark? Uh, probably not. You know, I, I'm, it, it, you know again, the way I play tennis, it's never going to be hit hard enough to cause somebody a bachelor's skull fracture, but um, probably not. Uh, so again, if there's any concern about a, what's referred to as a bachelor's skull fracture with either autorrhea or CSF rhinorrhea, there has to be a mechanism that results in that level of trauma that one would get concerned. With that being said, spontaneous CSF leaks occur just through erosion or small encephalocetals. Uh, provocative testing in the office. So if I'm worried, I usually have these individuals sit with their heads down between their knees for, for some period of time, three to five minutes. If it's a real CSF leak, it's gonna show. It'll be demonstrative and it'll be essentially like tap water. It will not be a mucoid runny nose. Um, but again, <clears throat> other signs that you'll see with basilar skull fractures, raccoon eyes, right? The bilateral ecchymosis, retromastoid ecchymosis, if there is a mechanism of the injury that usually includes the, the skull base, those are the classic signs you'll see. So CSF, rare, uh, uh, CSF leaks after head injury, rare, but if the mechanism's real and you have those signs, it, it's Pretty obvious when you see it. Second thing to say is most CSF leaks that are post-traumatic will heal independently. Spontaneous ones need repair. Um, there are uh, chemical analysis one can do, beta transferrin. Uh, it, can, it can be sent out as an, uh, an, as an external test, uh, which is definitive for CSF leak. Uh, and then lastly, diagnostic maneuvers by injecting certain dyes into the lumbar cistern and having ENT scope the patient is a definitive way of looking as well, either with or without a dye. Uh, but so we send them to ENT if we're concerned about a spontaneous or post-traumatic anterior skull base fistula. It's pretty definitive when they see it. So tennis ball, unlikely. I would agree with the, the way they handle that in the ED. Great, thank you. That's currently all the questions we have in the chat. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments they wanted to, to send over? If not, I want to thank the group okay. again for the invite. Sal, again, and Margaret, thank you very much for arranging it. It was great you could that, get together. 
Dr. Sedain, thank you so much. It was amazing. I, I can't believe some of the things you were able to do with the scope. Yeah. It just it was <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, Sorry, I, I, I joke with my residents. I, I trained for as long as I did, and 60% of my surgery is now through a burr hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. And, um, and you know, it, it just shows that, um, you know, as you move along, things, you know, they progress in such a way and less invasive and more corrective. And some of the wait and sees, um, I've, I've had in my practice lifetime, one child with histiocytosis and yeah. operated on and treated and yeah. even got chemotherapy. Um, yeah. it, it, but it, it's rewarding to see that through the course of one's career, you learn, contribute toward the advancement, but you know, it's all underscored by, you know, I'm, I'm a very naive person, but it's all underscored by the betterment of the way we take care of these children, yeah. honestly. Well, it's definitely a pediatric approach. That's what we like, yeah. right? So thank you again. We will bring you back. I'd like to remind our um, guest tonight that on March 13th, we will have a discussion. This is through our mental health committee on learning disorders, uh, dis uh, disorders. and on April 16th, Dr. Macaluso and Dr. Lettlestein will talk to us about breastfeeding. Thank you all again, and good night. Thank you. Have a good evening.